Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering PEDS, and to be more specific, I'm going to be teaching on the common cold and sore throat, important things you have to know, lots of patient teachings, medications, um, assessments. So uh, before I even get started, guys, if you haven't done so already, I don't know what you're waiting for. Make sure you guys check me out on my other social media platforms. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and also I have audio lessons available on my website. So if you're really struggling with a particular subject and you need to hear my voice, go in so you can do well on your exam. Check that out. My website's nexusnursinginstitute.com. Okay, guys, so let's get started. So we're going to get started with acute nasopharyngitis right here. Nasopharyngitis, um, acute viral nasopharyngitis. Look what it says. It says acute nasopharyngitis or the equivalent. This is a common cold. The common cold, guys, is viral. And I tell my students this all the time. You know, you can't be one of those parents that when your kid has a cold, just because you paid a 10, 15, $20 copay, you're demanding a prescription for antibiotics because antibiotics do nothing for a cold. A cold is viral, not bacterial. Okay. So it's a common cold and it's caused by rhinoviruses, RSV, adenoviruses, and enteroviruses, influenza virus, and para influenza virus. But notice that they're all viral infections. Symptoms are more severe in infants and children than adults. Why? Because adults have built up an immune system. They've been um, exposed to different viral infections throughout their life. So their body's gotten better at recognizing these vir viral infections and fighting them off than newborns and children. So that absolutely makes sense. Now, um, box 40.3, this is this box below. It just goes over those clinical signs and symptoms of the nasal pharyngitis, pharyngitis. I'm going to be going over them anyway, so you guys can take a look at the box, but I'm not going to go over that with you because I'm going to be covering it anyhow. So let's go to therapeutic management for the common cold. Look at what it says. Children with nasal pharyngitis, remember, this is just the common cold, they're managed at home. There is no specific treatment and effective vaccines are not available. There's no vaccine for the common cold and there's no cure. What we do guys is treat the symptoms. So if the patient has a runny nose, we'll treat that runny nose. If they have a cough, we'll treat the cough, a fever. We'll... So we treat the symptoms that accompany that viral infection, but there is no cure. And what I wrote down here, I wrote, it's a virus. So we treat how? Symptomatically, we treat the symptoms. Fluids and rest are recommended. You want to give the patient a humidified environment and increasing oral fluids. So this is the second time on the same page, they said we need to give that patient lots of fluids. You have to make sure you keep that patient hydrated. And here's why. Remember, infants and children, they go down very quickly. Okay, it's very easy for them to become dehydrated. So you have to make sure you give them plenty of fluids. Let's talk about cough suppressants. Cough suppressants containing dextromethorphan sh should be used with caution. Here's why, look at this. Cough is a protective way of clearing secretions. Let me stop right there. So if the patient has a wet cough, it doesn't make any sense to give them a cough suppressant because if they have a wet cough, that means that they have secretions that we want that patient to cough up and get it out because if they don't, Let's say those secretions just stay up there, right? In the upper um, respiratory airway. What happens when there's a moist, dark environment? What loves to grow in that environment? Bacteria. So here you are, you have a patient that started off with a viral infection, but because those secretions were just sitting there and they weren't able to cough it out, now they have a secondary infection, which is bacterial. We don't want that to happen. We want them to cough it up if they have secretions, okay? If they don't have secretions, then if the doctor orders a cough um, suppressant, we'll go ahead and give it as ordered. But if that cough is wet, are you just going to be a robot and give that medication? No. You're going to call that doctor and say, hey, you know, I noticed you ordered a cough suppressant, but I was listening 
to the lungs. I'm listening um, um, to that airway and I'm hearing lots of secretions that cough is wet. So let's keep going. So it says uh, cough suppressant should be used with caution, but it may be prescribed every six to eight hours for what kind of cough guys? Dry, not wet, dry hacking cough, especially at night. However, some preparations contain 22% alcohol and can cause adverse effects such as confusion, excitability, dizziness, nausea, and sedation. So the parents should monitor the child carefully for those adverse effects that can happen because of the alcohol that's in the medication. Let's keep going. Let me make this bigger because I can't see. Over-the-counter cough and cold medications, look at this guys, do not work for children younger than four years of age and in some cases may pose, in some cases may pose a health risk. So do we give these over-the-counter cough medicine to children four or younger? Absolutely not. Antihistamines are largely ineffective in treatment of nasal pharyngitis. These drugs have weak atropine-like effect that dry secretions, but they can cause drowsiness or paradoxically, when you see that word paradoxically, guys, that means ironically, having the opposite effect of what we expect to see, or paradoxically, have a stimulatory effect on children. So it's not a good idea to give an antihistamine to a child with a cold. There is no support for the usefulness of expectorants and antibiotics are usually not indicated because most infections are viral. I put a star next to it because this has been a, a test questions a million times. You need to know that. When it comes to the common cold, this is a viral infection. We do not give antibiotics for it, okay? Prevention, impossible. It is impossible to prevent the cold. Everyone's going to get the cold, okay? But there are some things you can teach uh, the patient and the parents on how to decrease the transmission, the spreading. Number one, frequent hand washing. And that's across the board, guys. In nursing, the number one way to decrease the spread of infection, I don't care what type of infection we're talking about, is going to be hand washing. You're going to teach frequent hand washing and avoiding touching one's eyes, nose, and mouth. Because what happens is you get these viruses, you get these bacteria on your hands, then you touch your mucous membranes of your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and that's the entryway into the, your body, okay? Care management. Elevate the head of the bed or crib mattress. Why? Whenever there's problems with respirations, you always want to elevate the head of the bed. It helps the patient to be, breathe better. The diaphragm doesn't have to fight uh, um, um, to um, go down when the patient's breathing. The lungs don't have to fight as much to try to expand. So you always want to have the head of the bed elevated. Suctioning and vaporization may help. Again, this is the third time we're seeing this fluid intake, maintain adequate fluid intake. And what does it say? Is essential. Notice I highlighted that in a different color. Whenever you're studying, guys, and you're seeing in the textbook, you're seeing words such as important, vital, necessary, uh, uh, essential. Bell should be going off of your head and you should say, you know what, this is really important. This probably won't be a test question. Uh, let me make sure I know this, okay? You're going to offer appropriate, just like the fourth or fifth time, appropriate what? Fluids. Why? You want to prevent dehydration. Remember, children are at high risk for becoming dehydrated. Avoid contact with affected people. When they're sick, this is not the time that they need to be going out to concerts or in crowds or around people, okay? Family members with a cold should carefully dispose of tissues, not share towels, glasses, or eating utensils. They need to cover their mouth and nose with tissues when coughing or sneezing. Wash hands thoroughly after blowing or blowing their nose or sneezing. Again, wash hands thoroughly and avoid touching the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. 
Let's look at box 40.4, evidence, early evidence of respiratory complications. I'm not gonna go over all of them, just a couple of them. Uh, parents are instructed to notify the healthcare professional if any of the following are noted. Evidence of an earache, such as the patient doing this, tugging on the ear, being, being irritable, having a fever, respirations faster than 50 to 60 breaths per minute, having a temperature 101 or higher, wheezing, confusion, refusing to eat. Did you guys know that eating is work? When you're eating, the work of eating can take oxygen away from you, especially if you're sick, you have an upper respiratory infection. So that absolutely is a huge bell that needs to be going off for evidence of respiratory uh, complications, okay? So make sure you guys take a look at that. And 40.1 shows a picture of um, inflamed tonsils and sore throat. This is tonsillitis and pharyngitis. All right, moving on. The, um, the family, the patient, they need reassurance that frequent colds are a normal part of childhood. It's normal, it's gonna happen, there's no way to avoid it. And that by five years of age, the children will have developed immunity to many viruses. Why? Because they've gotten sick so many times, especially if they're in day, um, daycare or preschool. You'll get a test question about a mom that comes in. She's very concerned. She can just start a daycare or preschool, keeps getting sick. That's normal. And, you know, like it or not, that's going to build their immune system. There's no way to avoid it. So that's why by the time they're five years old, we're going to see those um, colds and upper respiratory infections. They really start to decrease because that patient has built up an immune, a sufficient immune system. OK, so that's our common cold in a nutshell. Now, guys, we're going to move on to acute infectious pharyngitis. Sore throat and there are different types. Acute pharyngitis can be caused by many bacteria or viruses. So when the patient has a sore throat, unless you swab their throat and test it, we won't know for sure if it's bacterial or if it's viral. G-A-B-H-S, I hate when they do that, G-A-B-H-S. All right, we're talking about, okay. So this stands for a group A beta hemolytic, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus infection. That's a bacterial infection, by the way. Okay. So group A beta hemolytic strep infection is the most common causative organism for this infection. So when the patient, especially when it's children, they have a sore throat, the most common source of that sore throat is going to be strep. Group A beta hemolytic streptococcus, streptococcal infection. Okay. Children who experience GABHS infection of the upper airway, that's what's known as strep throat, because that S stands for streptococcus, okay? Strep throat, look at this, guys. You have to know this. I promise if you're in peds, it's going to be a test question. If you have um, end of semester exam in peds, it's going to be on your test. It's showed up on NCLEX lots of times. You have to know this. Look at what it says. Children who experience GABH infection of the upper, upper airway strep throat are at risk for rheumatic fever, an inflammatory disease of the heart, joints, and CNS, and acute glomerulonephritis. So it can affect not only the heart by causing that um, rheumatic fever, it also can affect the joints and the kidneys. This looks like a beautiful select all that applies to me, so you better know it, I promise. All right. Permanent damage can result from this sequelae, especially rheumatic fever. GABHS may also cause skin manifestations, including impetigo and pyoderma. Let me stop right there. So here's what happens. Um, patient has a sore throat, right? And the parents like, oh, you're just fine. They don't want to pay that copay, whatever. They don't take the kid into the pediatrician's office. And unfortunately, it wasn't a viral infection. It was strep that never got treated with a $2 antibiotic that you can get from Publix, right? Guess what? That patient 
from the strep, they now make these immune complexes that lodge in the heart, in the kidneys, in the joint. And this word sequely right here, this is like a cascade of events that happens from one event, like a domino effect, okay? All from the strep infection that could have been wiped away with literally antibiotics for $2. So it's very important, guys, I promise you're going to see this in peas. If the patient has a sore throat, you have to swap their throat and test it because if it is strep throat, which by the way, is the mo most common cause of pharyngitis, right? They have to get antibiotics. Okay. They have to get gram positive antibiotics. All right. Let's look at the signs and symptoms. The onset is often abrupt, characterized by pharyngitis, that's a sore throat, headache, fever, abdominal pain. The tonsils and the pharynx become inflamed and covered with exudate. That's that um, white, sometimes even yellowing uh, uh, coating, okay? This usually appears by the second day of illness. However, streptococcal infection should be suspected in children older than two years, eight, two years of age who have pharyngitis without exudate or nasal symptoms because it's so common. Do not take a chance and assume. You better swab them. The tongue may appear edematous and red. So it's going to be, it can appear swollen and red. It looks like a strawberry tongue. And the child may have fine sandpaper rash on the trunk, axilla, elbows, groin seen in scarlet fever, which is caused by a strain of group A uh, strep. The uvula is edematous and red. The nodes are often tender and it's hard for them to swallow. They'll say it hurts to swallow. That's, and they'll refuse to eat or even drink fluids because it hurts. Non-supportive complications may appear after the onset of GAB, GABHS, that's like group A hemolytics um, uh, streptococcus, AGN in about 10 days and rheumatic fever in an average of 18 days. This is important. I don't even know why I didn't highlight it. Hold on guys. So that strep, does it get treated? acute glomerulonephritis, now the kidneys are affected and we can start seeing that in 10 days. Rheumatic fever, hearts affected, joints affected, we start seeing that when in 18 days. So it's very important if it's strep, the patient gets what? Antibiotics. What type of antibiotics, Professor D? Um, gram positive. Antibiotics that kill gram positive um, microorganisms. All right. Diagnostic evaluation. A throat culture or rapid antigen testing should be performed to rule out that group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. You are going to swab their throat and see if the, what's growing, okay? You can either do a culture. We usually don't do cultures because cultures take days. We have to wait for this bacteria to grow to figure out what's wrong. So we do a rapid. When we swab them, we do a rapid test. But anyway, you can do both. Therapeutic management. Look at this. If streptococcal sore throat infections present, oral penicillin V or amoxicillin, both which are kills um, uh, um, gram-positive bacteria, guys, is prescribed for 10 days. 10 days to eliminate any organisms that might remain to initiate rheumatic fever symptoms. So for strep, they're going to get penicillin or amoxicillin for how many days? 10. They're going to get this, this antibiotic twice a day for 10 days. Patients with a history of rheumatic fever or who remain symptomatic after the full course of antibiotics may require a follow-up throat swab to see if they're still positive. An oral macrolide, either erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin is indicated for children who are allergic to penicillin. This is on NCLEX. You need to know this period. If a patient has to get uh, penicillin for whatever reason, but they're allergic to penicillin, they're going to get a mac macrolide, one of these, erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin. It is on NCLEX. You have to know this. And we know that for strep, they're going to get a penicillin penicillin V or amoxicillin. But if they're allergic, they're going to get one of these. 
peer management. Cold or warm compresses to the neck can help provide pain relief. Warm saline goggle, goggles can also, gargle, excuse me, may offer relief of throat discomfort. So you're gonna teach them to put some salt water and gargle four, six times a day. And sometimes that helps. Acetaminophen, that's a Tylenol, and ibuprofen can be effective in decreasing throat pain because they have analgesic effects. Pain may interfere with oral intake, and that's a problem because remember, children are easily dehydrated. We have to keep them hydrated, right? Pain may interfere with oral intake, and children should not be forced to eat, but fluid is, what, what's that word, guys? Essential. Without, what did I tell you about the word essential or important or necessary? It is essential. We've seen this about seven times, them telling us how important it is for the children to be hydrated. Don't force them to eat, but if you have to force them to drink, yeah, force them to drink. They have to drink, okay? Cool liquids, ice chips, or flavored ice pops could be tolerated better than solid foods. If an injection of penicillin is required, it must be administered. Look how you have to give the insulin if you have to give it parentally deep into a large muscle mass. You're giving it IM and it has to go deep in the vastus lateralis or the ventral gluteal muscle. Children are often considered infectious to others at the onset of symptoms and up to 24 hours after they've got antibiotic therapy. So from the time they have those symptoms until 24 hours after they've been started on antibiotics, they can still pass it on to someone else. They're infectious, okay? Look at this but they should not return to school or daycare until they've been taking antibiotics for a full 24 hours. Because remember that first 24 hours of taking the antibiotics, they can still pass it on. Nurses should remind children to discard their toothbrushes and replace them with new ones after they've been taking antibiotics for 24 hours. Why? So they don't reinfect themselves. So here you are taking antibiotics, but you're brushing your teeth with the same bacteria that you're trying to kill. So you'd keep reinfecting yourself. So after you've been on those antibiotics for 24 hours, you need to be using a new teeth toothbrush and you're gonna teach the parents that for the child. Orthodontic appliances should be washed thoroughly because they may harbor the organisms. Parents are cautioned to prevent other household members, especially immunocompromised, from having close contact with the sick child and avoid sharing, drinking, or eating items. That's also muy importante. And guys, that is your common cold and your sore throat in a nutshell. So I hope you guys found this to be helpful. I'm really trying to uh, push out more lessons for you guys because the response I've gotten is overwhelming. And so um, I'm very happy that you guys are enjoying this. Um, if there's something that you'd like to see me cover, please let me know. I'm really trying to cover as much as I can, as fast as I can. So that's why I'm jumping from you know, a med search to OB to PEDS to psych because I'm really trying to give something to everyone. But if there's something you want to see me cover, I haven't done so already, sound off in the comments, but be specific. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover and let me know if you'd like me to do it in this format where it's like a Zoom and I'm teaching or, you know, like the videos that come out on Sunday where I actually do questions on that topic. Don't forget, guys, you guys can check out my website. I've got lots of audio lessons available for you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me and you'll see me on the next video.